in the end will come from doing doing either method, but you get you get more matches, more actual matches and faster using these methods than you would using what, what you might suggest as a more naive type approach. So that's what we found. Thanks. Last question. Now, what's your experience about the, the real data for differential invariance? So the more derivatives you take, the noisier Absolutely. things become. Yeah. So they're, they're better than one might expect. And so that relates back to the smoothing question. Right. How do you smooth? I'll, I'll be happy to discuss what smoothing we use for that. For the bones, it's, it's not quite clear what the right level of smoothing is to do. And it may be that we have to... We have to give up on differential invariance and just work with integral invariance, which are well, much less subject to the derivative. But you have a derivative of the curvature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it works. It works surprisingly well. I mean, yeah, that was one of my hesitations going from the theory to the practice. But at least the yeah, two D yeah. puzzles it work remarkably well. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Speaker is our own. Uh, Professor Stephanie Pierce from OEB, and she's going to tell us about using multimetry to reveal macro patterns. Yes, thank you. Um, you're just talking about broken bones my whole life. It feels like it's broken bones because I'm a paleontologist. And so we have um, lots of broken, broken bones uh, in our research. Um, but as I said, I am a paleontologist. Um, I'm specifically a vertebrate paleontologist, so I study animals with backbones. And we're really interested in understanding how uh, changes in the musculoskeletal system over evolutionary time um, allowed animals to change their function and adapt to, to new environments. Um, one of the major things that um, we sort of focus on in my lab are major transitions in vertebrate evolution. Um, and I just wanted to give a, a definition of what I think a major transition is which are events which document the reorganization of one type of animal into something radically different. And I think that these are really exciting um, events in evolutionary history because they basically are documenting the organization of major <coughs> body plans. And along with that comes major transformations in form, which result in major transformations in function that will ultimately lead to animals um, adapting to, to new ways of life. And usually this results in some sort of new ecological adaptation or um, ecological diversification. Um, I'm going to introduce you to two major types of major transitions that we work on in my lab. Um, the first one is the fish to tetrapod transition. And that happened around 400 to 330 million years ago. And this is a really important event in uh, Earth's evolutionary history because it resulted essentially in all land-going vertebrate animals, uh, which we are one of. So it's a very important event in vertebrate evolution. Um, the other transition I'm going to introduce you to is the reptile to mammal transition. And this, of course, is also very important for us. Uh, this uh, transition resulted in what we might say is one of the most charismatic and ecologically diverse group of animals, which are the mammals. And this happened around, I would say, about 320 to 200 million years ago. So we're talking about a really, really, really long time ago. And finding fossils that document these transitions, as you can imagine, is very difficult. Uh, but one of our major aims when we're looking at these transitions um, in uh, the fossil record is um, to quantify form. And so I'm going to be introducing you to two projects where we have been using morphometry or morphometrics to quantify form as a major component of the methodological protocol um, for the major questions that we're addressing. Um, so with respect to the fish tetrapod transition, we're going to be looking at when did tetrapods start living on a uh, living and moving on land. I'm really interested in when um, the limbs in particular uh, gain the ability to support the body weight of an animal outside of water. And with respect to the reptile to mammal transition, we're going to be looking specifically at how the mammal backbone became regionalized over time. And I'm going to introduce you more to, to these two uh, uh, different areas. But I first wanted to 
uh, highlight my two people from my lab that are basically doing the, the majority of the work into the two projects that I'm talking about. Uh, the first one is my graduate student, Blake Dixon, who has been really pioneering the work that I'm going to talk about in terms of the fish tetrapod transition. And the other person is my postdoctoral researcher, Katrina Jones, who has done some fantastic work on um, mammalian backbone regionalization. And they're both in the audience today, so if you have more questions for them, they are here today. All right, so I thought I, because I'm a paleontologist and I work in such deep time, I thought it'd be really important that I introduce you to these transitions when they happen and, and, and some of the animals um, that are, are involved. So tetrapods, tetrapods are all animals that have limbs with hands and feet and fingers and toes, okay? So this includes today, and if we're looking at modern animals, they include amphibians, mammals, lizards, crocodiles, birds. Um, they also include animals that don't have uh, um, uh, limbs with fingers and toes, such as snakes, but snakes had ancestors that did. Um, so this is a, a really a major group of vertebrates, and, and a lot of our work is dedicated to, to this group of vertebrates. But there's also other groups of vertebrates, and these are the fishes, and they include our cartilaginous fishes, our sharks and our rays, our, uh, and our bony fishes. The ray fin fishes, these are the fishes that you would eat on your dinner plate, and you would see if you're scuba diving. Um, but we also have this other group of fishes, these are the low fin fishes, so they're sarcopterygian fish, they include um, the lung fishes and the really famous coelacanth. And if we basically draw a phylogenetic tree on here, we see that tetrapods actually share a common ancestor with these low fin fishes, okay? So, in fact, tetrapods are derived fish. Um, and at some point in their evolutionary history, they went from being a fish to being a tetrapod. So this is a major, tra major transition in vertebrate evolution. Now, they didn't just jump from being a fish to being a tetrapod. In fact, there's a long evolutionary history that's not represented by modern forms here. And that's really filled in by extinct animals. And so this is where we're doing a lot of our work. And those extinct animals, if we look at them over evolutionary time, they document uh, the transition from things that are fish, but more closely related to tetrapods than they are to the other low fin fishes. And if we go through evolutionary time, we see them slowly transforming into what we consider to be a tetrapod. So this is a very early tetrapod known as Acanthostega. It has limbs, it has digits at the, at, on, its figure, or on its hands and its feet, but it still actually quite looks like more of a fish in a way. So we have these transitional forms that fit the gap in between uh, our, modern, our modern groups. And these animals that fit the gap are what are representing what we refer to as the fish tetrapod transition. Yeah. Uh, since these are like extinct, when paleontologists like reconstruct these images from, do they get like each part of the bone or like it's sort of Yeah, like so some, some animals uh, we have quite a lot of information from. We're talking about 400 million years ago, so we don't have a lot of animals where we have all of the material there. But for ones that we do, we can make pretty nice reconstructions. We don't know if that's the color of the animal, but we can have a general sense of what their body structure was what like. The, sorry, the, the tail of the... Yeah, can you, the, the, this can one, you reconstruct? We know that that's what the tail looked like. Yeah, the tail had these, uh, we call them lepidotrichia on them. It's a very uh, fish-like characteristic, actually. So some animals we can reconstruct better than others. All right, so just to give you a little bit of geological history here, this is a geological time scale starting from the present day and going back in time. And I just want to point out where in geological history we find this uh, transition. So if we start in the present day, we're actually up here in the Cenozoic, and this is normally referred to as the age of the mammals. This is when mammals really started to dominate the planet. Um, we have all major groups of mammals evolving, and some of them got really big, such as the woolly mammoth, but we also have other animals coming onto the scene that are more typical, such as horses and other things like that, and of course humans. 
If we go further back in time into the Mesozoic, this is known as the age of the reptiles. It's primarily known as the age of the reptiles because this is when we have all the dinosaurs around, but we have lots of other reptiles at this time, including crocodiles and marine reptiles that are no longer alive today. Uh, we need to go even further back in time to find the, the fish tetrapod transition. So basically at the beginning of the Paleozoic here in the Carboniferous and Permian period, we actually have tetrapods at that time, but this is when they're actually diversifying uh, into terrestrial environments and starting to sort of swallow up ecological niches. Uh, just before that, we have the Devonian period, and this is known as the age of the fishes. Um, so the waters are basically teeming with all sorts of different fishes, and they're basically the ancestors of all major fish that I've read, sort of introduced you to, the cartilaginous fish and, and the various bony fish. And it's really within the age of the fishes where we see the first tetrapods. So the first tetrapods come on the scene around 380 million years ago, but of course their ancestors arrived a bit earlier, about 400 million years ago, and then the fish tetrapod transition basically occurs over this uh, time period right here. When did insects well, come onto land? Yeah. Uh, around the, around same, the time. same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Carboniferous period is normally the time that we think of most things coming out on time. Okay, so that was just to give you a little bit of background into, yes? Is that, so what, uh, during that time, is that when there was more oxygen or more plants? Yeah, well, this? plants came out first, and then we have insects, and, and, and we have um, vertebrates coming out at the same time as well. Oxygen levels go up and down. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, the fish tetrapod transition is obviously, it's a major transition. We have this complete reorganization of the body plan of animals. So at one end, we're starting with a fish that's swimming around in water, living in a marine habitat. At the other end, we end up with an animal that's walking around on land. Okay, so we have this really big transformation. We have... Um, not only a transformation in form, but we have a transformation in ecology. And this is what we're really interested in, is when these animals, at what point during this transition, were they able to walk around on land? Um, it seems that the earliest tetrapods were still evolving within an aquatic habitat, but at some point, they be, we were able to make the leap onto land. One thing we're really interested in is um, how the underlying bony structure of the appendages changed and how that allowed this transformation to occur. If we look at the underlying skeleton of uh, the appendages, um, there are major differences, of course. Um, at one end, we have fully fledged fins. Um, we have a lot of you know, fin rays that are allowing the animal to, to swim through the water. And at the other end, we have hands and feet with digits. So there, there's major differences in and, and, and form that are creating major differences in function, but there's also a lot of similarities as well. They actually have an underlying bony structure that's very similar and that we can trace throughout this entire transition. And one bone that we're working on right now that you can trace across this transition is the humerus bone. So this is the humerus bone, the same humerus bone that you have. Our fish ancestors had that same bone <coughs> And it actually changes in morphology as we go across this transition. And so we've been really focusing uh, right now on the humerus bone and what it can tell us about this transition. So our big question is, how did the humerus change from being a fish to being a tetrapod? But then also, can the humerus shape inform us about local water ecology and when these animals were starting to, to move around on land? And the humerus is, is, is really interesting because, again, it, you can trace it throughout this transition, but also it's a major component of the limb skeleton, you know. The humerus is attaching to the body, and it's anchoring all the major musculature in order to allow animals to, to move their appendages in different ways. I, I seem to recall that recently there are some very interesting experiments done in African lungfish, which when they were bred in humid environments versus when they were allowed Yeah, to... that, those were polypterids, yeah. They're, they're not actually um, sarcopterygian fish, those are actinopterygian fish, but yes. And you can see this transition happening during development, yes. where you start to see limb-like 
Muscular. Yeah, the, the, the skeleton chart starts to change shape and the muscles start exactly. to change shape in order to deal with the forces of gravity. And so how much, is, and is this a question that you can, or you can start to address, how much plasticity is there during development in the context of the environment which allows you to shift compared to what happens on an evolutionary time scale? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I don't think we know enough about that, and especially in the fossil record, we definitely don't know how much plasticity there was. There's some interesting studies that have been done on this animal here, Acanthostata, where we have a little bit of a bone bed, and it's sort of shown that it seems like a lot of the specimens may have been juveniles that were sort of living in this little aquatic environment, but sort of get it. And that was really one of the only studies done on fish that you mentioned. All right, so we've been trying to quantify humorous shape. Um, so that we can get at how it's changing over evolutionary time. So basically, we're just going into fossil collections, taking humeri, and then we're CT scanning them, fixing if any breaks or anything in the scan, and then we're basically wrapping meshes with a whole bunch of landmarks. And this is, um, we're using this uh, program called Auto 3D GM, and from Doug Boyer, and Diane mentioned it in his talk, so if you want to know more about that, you can ask him. Um, we then take those, those, those humeri and those landmarks and we project them into a principal components analysis and we can see how the humerus is changing over evolutionary time. And what we find is that we have this pretty constrained path that we, that we see of humerus shape in time. At this end we have our fish. We then go into animals that are our are, are earliest tetrapods. And then we end up over here with animals that are the ancestors to mammals and reptiles and amphibians. So animals up here that are definitely terrestrial. So we have this transition from fish uh, to, to tetrapod, but we also have a transition from going from swimming and living in a marine environment then to living on land. What are the sites? What are the size? What, what about the changes in size? You mentioned shape over here. So yeah, so we've removed size. I understand, but yeah. isn't size also a very likely size part is, of the problem? Uh, size is changing, but I mean, some of our fish ancestors were some of the biggest animals at the time. So there's a really big size size range that are. And but I'd say most of the stuff that we're looking at, there are things that you can hold in your hand. And the size of the humerus is isometric with uh, body size or not? Probably not. And, but of course we can't, we can't tell you what the body what size is because we're just looking at individual humeri. And so, and this actually allows us to increase sample size because if we were just relying on animals that had full bodies, we'd probably have like five <laughs> in our data set. Um, so this is really preliminary, um, preliminary uh, data, but the nice thing about having using GMN yet. That's a quick question. So, so, so what happens to the landmarks? So there's so many morphological features to identify, or this. So no. So this is an automated landmarking approach. Right. So basically, the humerus, uh, especially in these these early forms, there's very few anatomical <laughs> landmarks that you can trace across the transition and that you can really identify in terms of being homologous. And so we've chosen a, a technique that automatically landmarks it so that we can capture the entire shape, so that we can look at full shape transformation. But this would not be homologous to another similar... Pardon? This would not be homologous to, to another similar structure from another animal. Uh, no, we can look at how the shape is changing, though, right. but we can't... Yeah. It, it's a bit more difficult. So I'm like happy to talk about it, but it, it, is, it is difficult when you're looking at something where you're starting with a fish at one side, and a tetra uh, on the other. So. so we're just trying to sort of characterize full bony transformation. And that's what we're sort of capturing here, is that basically we're, we're in this video, we're tracking the evolutionary history of the, the humerus in three dimensions from <coughs> our fish ancestors all the way through to, um, this, it's gonna come up here, to an ancestor of modern mammals and we're basically by, bypassing all the really species-specific information. And so using this technique, we can see how the overall shape of the humerus is changing over evolutionary time, and that's really great. We've now been able, we can use this technique to, to characterize how shape is changing, but we're, we're missing some information. <laughs> um, we really want to know 
what this shape could tell us about locomotor ecology. Shape on its own can't really tell us anything about locomotor ecology. We need to add more information to that. So the thing that we want to add to this is function. And so we don't want to just add function in, a, in separately to this. What we're trying to do is add everything together into a, into a morpho space. So we've decided to sort of go into the realm of functional adaptive landscapes. So where we have our morphology all characterized, and we're going to characterize some aspect of function. And we're going to see along an adaptive landscape whether or not certain animals are, are fitting to particular peaks on an adaptive landscape. And our hope is that an adaptive peak will be representative of maybe animals living in a marine environment or animals living in a terrestrial environment. And those animals that are closer to the peak in that particular environment perhaps are using that environment to move around in. And then I'm going to go through our, our general workflow of how we're, how we're trying to deal with this. It's really hard to just go from fossils to, to figure out locomotor ecology, and so a lot of times we try to use modern animals as validation for, for the techniques that we're using. And so we've decided to sort of test our techniques out on turtles. <laughs> now turtles are really great. Turtles have a shell which means that they really don't use their body to move around. They're basically just moving their limbs. That's their primary mode of locomotion. They also, in their evolutionary history, have uh, made transitions between different environments. Um, so in this clade that we're looking at, um, they are primitively semi-aquatic animals, but they've also they've independently um, evolved into marine habitats and they've multiple times independently evolved into terrestrial habitats. So we've got sort of a similar thing happening uh, with respect to the, the fish, fish tetrapod transition. Much um, more recently? Pardon? Much more recently? Much more recently, yeah. This is the time frame down here. Um, so we're talking, you know, sort of like at the end of the, the reptile mammal transition, yeah. Do you mean that the presence of the shell can kind of take out of the equation, like contribution of trunk or kind of. to movement? Yeah. Okay, so that you can more, we just can better isolate. We can better isolate the limb in that way. Mm -hmm. okay. And these animals, they move in very different ways. Obviously on land, they're walking. Uh, in, in water, uh, in the marine uh, turtles, uh, when they swim, they use a flapping type of motion. And then the semi-aquatic animals, they're kind of doing an in-between. All right, so they're able to walk, but when they swim, they use more of a rowing action. And then these animals down here, these are the soft shell turtles. They rarely come out onto water. And they're, they're doing something more similar to the marine turtles, yes. But the, um, the fish cycops and, and the early tetrapods, they probably mutilate their body as they're moving. Yes. So that was definitely probably contributing to how they were swimming there, swinging their yes. bones. That, that was not but in happening. terms of modern groups, I think that this is a pretty isolated good validation group to, to look at. And they're, and they're moving, in di moving in different ways um, that are representative of their different environments. So we've been capturing shape very similarly. We've been wrapping uh, humeri in landmarks, and then we've been exploring that morpho space. And the funny thing is, is it looks almost exactly like our early tetrapod morpho space, where we have our marine animals here, we have our semi-aquatic animals here, and we have our terrestrial animals up here, and those are represented by very different uh, humorous morphologies. So that's very promising, but we don't just want to stop there. We want to sort of add function into this and see if we can sort of predict where these animals are living based just on humorous morphology. And so basically we create a grid. This is a six by four grid of humori throughout this entire space, and we back transform those morphologies out into 3D shapes, and we perform all of our functional uh, experiments on those shapes. So the functional uh, characteristics that we've been looking at, first of all, we look at how strong the bone is, and we've been using a technique known as finite element modeling to look at how strong the bone is. Uh, you'd think that having a strong bone would be pretty important in terms of locomotion. We've been looking at a variable called stride length, which, which is essentially just the curvature of the bone. So it's being said that 
by curving the humerus, it actually will increase stride length for animals that are walk or for turtles that are walking around on land. They've got this really big shell, and it's really hard for their limbs to get past that shell. So by by curving their humerus, they can actually get past their shell. But before that size, huh? before that size should be important. The longer the humerus, the longer the stride length. Yes, that is that is true. Um, but that's not. We're not. We we don't want to factor in size into the equation because also we have. It, it's not really about stride length in that way. It's about a, a bony metric that can get at okay. how well an animal could potentially increase their stride. Um, we're looking at me mechanical advantage of muscles. Um, so this is like how, how how much leverage a particular muscle have has, and specifically we're looking at the pectoralis muscle. Um, and then we're looking at hydrodynamics. So basically hydrodynamics is just the frontal area of the humerus. Um, this is the humerus and the frontal area, which is basically incorporating some of that soft tissue. And if you're a marine organism, you'd think that you'd want to have pretty good hydrodynamics as opposed to being a terrestrial animal. So our hope is that we get some sort of functional trade-offs between the different environments with respect to these different functional variables. <clears throat> We then can map those variables, those functional variables, back into our amorphous space and create these performance surfaces. And you can see that we do have functional trade-offs from these uh, different um, functional parameters that we mentioned. They're, they're not perfect. We, in a perfect scenario, we, we would want functional trade-offs in all four of these quadrants, but they do a pretty good job. So for instance, if we look at bone strength, bone strength is highest in the top right corner here. Uh, if we look at stride length, it's best over here on the right. This is where we find animals that are locomoted on land. Uh, hydrodynamics is good down in this uh, part of morpho space, and this is where we're finding more of the animals that are living um, in a, primarily in aquatic environments. So we take these uh, performance um, surfaces, and then from that, we're creating adaptive landscapes. Um, so basically what we want to do is find the uh, peak in the adaptive landscape that is optimal for each of these ecologies. And so basically our adaptive landscape is W here, and what we want to do is find the weighting of each of these functional parameters that best explain each of these uh, different ecologies. And so we see that um, the functional, or so the adaptive landscape for marine um, Ecologies is over here on the left-hand quadrant, and it's represented by basically having strong bones and good hydrodynamics, whereas stride length and the mechanical advantage of the pectoralis is not really coming into play in this functional adaptive landscape. In semi-aquatics, we have the adaptive peak over here, and they have a pretty good representation of all of these functions, where strength of the bone is pretty important, same with hydrodynamics. Um, stride length is also important. And then we have our terrestrial landscape with the peak up in the right-hand corner. And in this landscape, um, strength is, is, is more important, and we have stride length also being important, but some of these other characters are also important. It doesn't really make sense why hydrodynamics is, is so important in this, but perhaps we're not representing that as accurately as we can. So what you see here is some, some lines. These are the prior fronts which are basically lines connecting each of the peaks with one another. And these would be the sort of the lines of least resistance if you were going to evolve from one ecology into another. This would be the functionally best line that you'd want to sort of stick to. Because you wouldn't want to um, go back and down into a valley to get to another adaptive peak. That's sort of the thought behind that. And what we find is that the semi-aquatic turtles, they actually follow this line really well. And these animals out here, these are the soft shell turtles that spend most of their time in water and have sort of a, a, a locomotory behavior that's much more similar to the marine turtles. And this transition between terrestrial and marine, which you can see here, doesn't seem as likely. So this is sort of like the idea behind this, and I think um, we're, we're starting to get somewhere. But what is, what is it actually telling us um, that we think that turtle locomotor ecology is being reflected in the shape of the humerus, 
and that the shape of the humerus is Im imparting different functional trade-offs depending on which ecology or ecological environment you're living in, and that the humerus seems to follow adaptive peaks um, throughout sort of this evolutionary morphospace that I showed you. Um, but really the next thing is to do is to apply this to the fish tetrapod transition to see if we can get any idea of where these animals li are living in, in comparison to, to their own adaptive peaks and, and whether or not we can say when the animals were sort of living more primarily and, and moving more primarily in a, in a terrestrial environment. And I'm almost at the end of my time, so I have more to talk about, but I think probably I'll stop there because I don't want to go too, too long. So, so, this, five minutes left. so this is still ongoing. We don't have the answers to this one yet. We do not have the answers. This was a brand new in-progress study um, that, that, that we've been doing, or that Blake has been doing. Some really fantastic work. How similar are the bones of the turtles to the actual, to the actual humeri of the, of the Sarcops and early tetrapods might be. Uh, not, good. but they're yeah. homologous. <laughs> right, they're homologous, but yeah. they, uh, because the exact shape is different as well. The shape is different. Made, made, yeah, so the shape is different, but, but the purpose of, of why we did that was just to see whether or not the humerus, just an isolated bone, can give us any insight into the locomotor ecology of a major group of animals. And so, you, but then you probably want to look at other similar groups that are dealing with similar transitions to see if there is actually a commonality because there could be diff very different ways by which they actually were adapting to these transitions because of very distinct uh, studying shapes. It is true. Unfortunately, it takes a really long time to do this, <laughs> um, but but it is true. I mean, you could look at carnivores or uh, and the, the group that you pick is you know. It's not that easy to find animals that totally. What I'm saying is that these are convergent scenarios, right? And in order to find common denominator, I think you need to kind of see what, how much this shape's actually just. These are very functional differences, probably as well. Probably. I think it's pretty promising that we've been able to pull so much information out of one book. Mm -hmm. How do you select the reads? Like, is it an optimization? It's an optimization, and Blake well, could probably tell you about But it's basically being optimized for the main shape of each ecology. And it's, it's iteratively going through and finding the weights of each of those four functions and um, making them equal to one. So all of those functions equal to one, and it's finding the optimum that's um, optimizing for the main shape of each ecology. For, for animals to go back the other way, like marine mammals, do they yep. go back the same route, or is it a completely different route? Um, my my hunch, and based on, you know, we talk a lot about this in my lab, is that you're probably going to have to go between the semi-aquatic environment, right? So, yeah. so either if you're going from marine to terrestrial or terrestrial to marine, there's going to be some sort of semi-aquatic zone in there. Whether or not animals can go from terrestrial to marine and back, it doesn't, it seems like it's, it would be a very difficult thing to do. But we've been searching in the literature at fossil turtles, like really early fossil turtles, the very stem group, and they seem to have some unusual morphologies that, that seem to be kind of similar to this, and they've been suggested to be marine maybe, or maybe they weren't marine. And so, I don't know how often you could do this, and, and, but it seems like this is normally the route you want to take. Can I ask a question yeah. about uh, the transition that you see in turtles? Uh, you, you looked at, or turtles of horses, you have access because they're extant uh, yeah. to muscles. Is yeah. there a large variation in the musculature and or the places where they're attached during so there, the process? There's not a large variation in terms of the overall, like how many muscles there are and where they're attaching, but there is differences in how big they are and where they're attaching, where that process is located. And so in the terrestrial turtles, like for the pectoralis, the pectoralis is actually smaller, but it's got a really big uh, delta pectoral crest that it attaches to, creating really good leverage for movement. In the um, marine turtles, they have really big pectoralis muscles, but they're kind of more like sheets. 
because they're doing a very different type of locomotion. But they do have different neuromuscular activations. Um, so, and, and we think that's because um, marine turtles, they've gone from an ancestor that would have been moving its limbs like this to doing this. <coughs> so they have to compensate by firing the muscles at slightly different times, which allows the muscles to function in slightly different ways. More questions? If not, let's thank uh, Stephanie Pierce. <laughs> Coffee break before the next session and the last couple of months. Thank you very much.